During the Second World War, Ukraine suffered more destruction than any other European country. Departing from Ukraine, both German troops and the Soviet army in 1941 resorted to the tactics of scorched earth. They destroyed everything that was possibly of benefit to their enemy. Ukraine experienced the method of scorched earth several times. It is a fact that the Soviet side launched the evil tactic of scorched earth in Ukraine in 1943 during the Soviet offensive and accordingly the retreat of the Germans in 1943 to 1944. Similar actions were executed by the invading enemy, so we cannot discard the fact that such methods were applied during the Nazi occupation. The matter is about the actions of the Soviet partisans, which represented the underground. This is about the actions of special teams of NKVD, which carried out radio-controlled explosions and carried out terrorist acts, sabotage of means of communication, industrial enterprises. Among them was the destruction of Khrushchev and destruction of the cathedrals of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra in the Ukrainian capital. After the expulsion of the Germans and the end of hostilities, Ukraine faced the colossal task of restoring the country's economy. As professor of history at Harvard University, Serhii Plohi notes, the Ukrainian National Republic became one of the main victims of the Second World War. In order to prove his opinion, he cites the following figures. It turns out that Ukraine lost 7 million of its citizens, which amounted to more than 15% of its population. Of the 36 million Ukrainians that survived, around 10 million did not have a roof over their head, and around 700 cities and towns and 20,000 villages lay in ruins. Ukraine lost 40% of its wealth and more than 80% of its arsenal of industrial and agricultural equipment. Ukraine appeared before the people who came to liberate it as a destroyed country. It was a land filled with sorrow, a land filled with death, a land where there was practically no accommodation available with normal living conditions. If we take Kyiv, almost 70% of the residential infrastructure was destroyed. Most of the city's production facilities, more or less suitable for rapid recovery, were destroyed. The Kyiv government was faced with the task of restoring the city's economy, its industrial infrastructure and the peaceful life of its citizens. These tasks were the priorities on the agenda of the city authorities of Kyiv, which had regained control. It is known that the United States offered the leaders of the USSR to include Ukraine in the Marshall Plan. However, Stalin refused and transferred the full weight of the recovery to men, women and young people. Stalin refused to participate in the Marshall Plan, as it put certain obligations to the Soviet Union and one of its requirements was access to the territory of the Soviet Union in order to control the funds allocated within this plan. The funds could not be used for further arming the army. According to Western experts, it was easier to build new plants than to restore the obsolete production facilities. Historians believe that Stalin was not willing or ready to participate in new economic and social experiments. This positive moment of victory actually played a negative role for further development. It actually legitimized the system of power that existed in the Soviet Union. It also justified the repressive totalitarian system. After the war, there were no other ways of effective management and no other methods of interaction in society at large. In the post-war period, the pages of newspapers and newsreels told of the heroism of the Soviet people, the restoration of Zaporizhstal and other industrial giants. 
about the launch of the first turbine at the restored Dniprovsky hydroelectric station. But these victorious relics kept silent about the price paid for such success. All this was achieved through the application of cruel command and administrative methods of management and compulsory work. The entire territory of Ukraine was full of labor camps. For example, there was a system of Czechian people who were in captivity, were surrounded or were repatriated. The so-called Czech filtration camps of the NKVD, or special camps. A part of these camps was on the territory of Ukraine in industrial regions, and people who were checked were not just sitting in barracks, they worked on the restoration of objects, and very often people in these camps were checked beyond the norm. This lasted for more than three months because the NKVD was interested in these people working at the plants where the camp was located. That is, the camp system was also spread onto the territory of Ukraine. The authorities also actively used the methods of the so-called labor mobilization, whereby the workers were attributed to specific enterprises and were forced to work without the right to leave their jobs. Those who left their place of employment were sent to concentration camps. People were not formally arrested, they were simply tied to the place of work, a collective farm or an industrial plant. You could not leave the place of study or work where you were appointed. Be it a school or a hard labor crew, people who returned from Germany, men especially, women, were mobilized. Some of them in the army, others in workers' groups. They worked in the mines or at factories. Conditions of detention were far away from their barracks. They worked very hard and were not paid a salary. They could not maintain contact with their family or go with them on vacation. This is an example of the mobilization economy and forced labor, which were not only when a person was arrested. A number of forms of work and funds were mobilized. The people were formally free. The regime in Kyiv, with the restoration of Hrishatik, was similar. It was also carried out by harsh and strict methods of forced mobilization. Archival documents found in recent times are testimony to the fact that the so-called workers' battalions were formed not only of Ukrainians, but also foreigners of German origin who were sent to Ukraine for forced labor. In the spring of 1945, the State Planning Committee of the USSR, while planning labor resources for the restoration of the economy, sent a request for the NKVD for several million. Several million. It was planned that the mobilized workers would be engaged in the restoration of industry. And these millions were to be taken from the people of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe that were occupied by the Soviet army. This is the German ethnic population, better known as the mobilized interned citizens of German origin. Then in February to April 1945, they were transported to the territory of the Soviet Union, most of them to the territory of Ukraine. Labor forces were formed from these Germans and they were exploited to restore various industries and infrastructure. Undoubtedly, the main burden of restoring the country fell on the shoulders of ordinary Ukrainians, but the Soviet government actively exploited the work of German prisoners of war. During the Second World War from 1943 to 1945 and further in the post-war period, 44 stationary labor camps for foreign prisoners of war were established on the territory of the USSR. These camps had up to 270 camp departments at different times. So we witnessed the formation of a colossal system of forced labor of captives. According to various estimates, at different times about half a million foreign prisoners worked in these camps. To make it clear, this amounts to about a quarter of all foreign prisoners of war who were in Soviet captivity during the Second World War and most of the post-war period. Most of the prisoners' camps were located in the industrialized regions of Ukraine, the Donetsk, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporizhia oblasts, while single camps were located in the Lviv, Ternopil and Vinnytsia oblasts. 
Up to 60% of the labor contingent of prisoners of war camps in the period of 1943 to 1945 was exploited in the coal and metallurgical industries. After World War II, this localization of the industry was somewhat expanded. Then the prisoners of war were exploited not only in the coal and metallurgical industries, but also for restoration and construction of industrial enterprises in the light industry, the food industry, the urban economy, different infrastructural facilities, seaports, railways and highways. By the way, the moscow Simferopol highway was totally built by prisoners of war. A large number of prisoners of war who participated in the post-war reconstruction can be confirmed by the cemeteries and burial sites that are scattered all across Ukraine. If to talk about how many prisoners of war rested in peace on Ukrainian land, it should be noted that I managed to establish an approximate number thanks to research of archives. The number is approximate, as we do not have accurate documents today. It amounts to as much as 120,000 buried POWs. These are landscape cemeteries with mass, single or group graves. The fate of these burials is different. After the war, when the prisoners of war were repatriated and the camps ceased to exist, they were gradually destroyed and raised to the ground. And today there are very few of them left. Recently they were taken under guard. They are cared for by volunteer and community organizations. While getting ready for a new confrontation with the West, the Soviet authorities carried out the post-war reconstruction one-sidedly. Heavy industries recovered at an accelerated rate. However, the growth of industry did not lead to an increase in people's standards of living. There was a serious shortage of clothing, footwear, hygienic and food products. The agricultural sector was also in a difficult position, since it was destroyed not only by the war, but also by the collective farm system of management. The catastrophe in the country's agrarian sector was devastated by severe drought. But instead of assistance, the government continued to pop out the less supplies of food products from the rural regions. In 1946 to 1947, Ukraine suffered from a massive famine. It's clear that all these conditions, plus the policy of the Soviet leadership, were the cause of this famine. A large number of Communist Party workers were sent to Ukraine. While earlier there were 5,000 authorized employees in the grain procurement sector, this number was increased to 11,500. And then the Soviet authorities began applying heavy pressure on Ukrainian farmers in order to take away all the bread from them. In this way, farmers were not only deprived of their own grain, which was their pay for workday, but the seed grain that was planned for sowing on Ukrainian fields in 1947 was also usurped. As such, a crisis erupted and people began suffering from starvation. The Second World War had not only devastating consequences for Ukraine. After the war, its borders were significantly expanded and the composition of the population changed radically. For the first time in many centuries, most ethnic Ukrainians found themselves within one state. However, under the harsh regime of Joseph Stalin, there was an attempt to bring the inhabitants of the western regions of Ukraine into line with the Soviet system. The party, the Soviet and the punitive organs continued the so-called socialist transformations that were launched in the period of 1939 to 1941, which were accompanied by a massive terror campaign. In these conditions, the people of the western regions of Ukraine had no choice but to continue the national liberation struggle against Soviet power. Risking their lives, mostly young people joined units of the Ukrainian insurgent army under the slogan we will fight for the freedom for Ukraine or we will die for it.
The Soviets responded to the actions of the insurgents in 1947 by wild-scale forced deportation of hundreds of thousands of people suspected of supporting the underground. We very often think that the greatest Stalinist repressions were in 1937. In fact, these were post-war repressions. Most of the people in the Gulag were in 1949, 1937. Whole nations were shuttled away to this barren land. The authorities simply exiled all those who were disobedient to the system. After experiencing the severity and horrors of the terrible war and pain for the victory over the enemy by destruction and great loss of life, the people of Ukraine hoped for radical changes in society, stopping the repression and improving their material conditions of life. However, their hopes were dashed. The main goal of the Stalinist regime was the quick restoration of the economic potential of the Soviet Union to strengthen its position in the confrontation with the Western world. As such, poverty and hunger, denunciations and arrests, repression and fear, humiliation and disregard for human dignity returned to the peaceful life of the people.